Hi, Gary Stearman coming to you from the studios of Prophecy Watchers with a very good friend. You know who he is, and he comes here from time to time to share his wisdom with us. It's Avi Lipkin. Avi, welcome to, to uh, Prophecy Watchers. Love you guys. Love you too. Now, uh, when you come by, uh, we learn things, uh, the sort of behind the scenes uh, news items that are connected with Israel and hence connected with Bible prophecy. And so, uh, go ahead and uh, kind of fill us in on what's happening in Israel today, what, what's happening in your life, etc. I want to talk a little bit about the history of Iran. Now today Iran is the great enemy of the United States and Israel because they've been saying since 1979, death to America, death to Israel. Uh, so America is faced, Israel is faced by, uh, I would say, I take the liberty of saying an atomically powered enemy. Uh, stirring up trouble in Lebanon, Syria, Iraq, Yemen, and of course even in Israel, in Gaza, they're backed by the Iranians, Iraq. Um, now, just before 1979, Iran had a leader. It's true, he was a dictator, the Shah of Iran. He was a dictator. There is no democracy in Islam. There is none of this Republican and Democrat you know, chit-chat about who's right and who's wrong. There, you, when you are the leader of an Islamic country, you are a dictator, because if you're not a dictator, you will fall from power, probably, and be killed. Mm -hmm. The Shah of Iran was America's best friend and Israel's best friend in the Islamic world. Yes, the Shah of Iran was a Muslim. He was a Shiite Muslim. And uh, Iran um, developed, westernized, and when we say westernized, it, becomes, it means becoming more modern, but it also means becoming more pro-Christian. Science, engineering, uh, they were actually leaders in, in many ways. The Shah did a remarkable job. Uh, he was the cornerstone of American policy in the Middle East during the Cold War. Uh, actually, the Iranian nuclear project started uh, under the Shah. In other words, Israel and the United States helped the Shah of Iran to develop a nuclear project. This is not something that Ayatollah Khomeini started, this is something that the Shah started. And uh, America gets a president, a Democratic president, by the name of Jimmy Carter. And Jimmy Carter was shocked at the things he was hearing about the dictatorship of the Shah. And he and Zbigniew Brzezinski put together a plan not to support the Shah, but to bring him down. Because, you see, Americans cannot fathom the torture, the killing, the chopping up of people, which goes on in the Muslim world. And the Muslims do it to each other. Of course, we saw with ISIS, what ISIS was doing to Christians and uh, Yazidis and others in the caliphate. And ISIS was also chopping up Muslims. Anybody who was suspected of treason was chopped up, killed, chopped up, whatever. So the first thing that happens when Zbigniew Brzezinski and Jimmy Carter depose the Shah, or shall I say they, don't, they do not back him to stay in power, is look what we got as a result. We got Ayatollah Khomeini, the fanatic Shiite regime, which suppressed all of the groups in Iran. The labor groups, the socialist groups, the democratic groups, the women's groups, suppressed all of them and imposed a fanatic Muslim regime, Shiite Muslim regime on the people of Iran. And what I wanted to say to President Trump is we have to look at what is the outcome of an American decision regarding what happens with Khashoggi. And I talk about it indeed in my book, Islamic Rivalry. I talk about all the different forces at play where the Russians back the Iranians and the Shiites and the Americans and the Europeans back the Sunnis. By the way, when did you write this book? I just wrote this three years ago. Three years ago. It's called Islamic Rivalry, ISIS and Iran fighting each other for the heart of, of Islam. And chopping each other up in pieces. And, and chopping each other up in pieces. This is very important to America in what way? Well, you see, Americans are, I would say, one-dimensional. Uh, Jesus Christ has made Americans such loving, sweet people. You know, there's a saying, it takes a thief to know a thief. You guys are not thieves. You're not able to be thieves because you're one-dimensional. You have this lovey-dovey uh, Bible way of thinking, and I would say so do I. <laughs> it's just, I live in the Middle East, 
and my wife comes from the Middle East, and so I've become a thief. I've been inoculated uh, by my wife and by living in Israel 50 years, and I see that they go by different rules. Americans cannot fathom it. They can't comprehend how a human being can go ahead and chop another human being to pieces and then drop the body parts in acid. Uh, this is a horrible thing that took place in the, um, uh, in the uh, Saudi uh, consulate in Istanbul. Horrible thing. But this is the norm in the Islamic world. Now, having laid that out as a basic premise, um, <clears throat> If you could talk to our president, if you could talk to the leaders of our country, what would you tell them? What do they vitally need to know today uh, on the basis of what you're, you're talking about? America has an ally. Israel has an ally called Egypt. Egypt used to be our worst enemy. Egypt today is an ally. I don't know for how long, but the president of Egypt is a general, was a general of the Egyptian army. His name is Assisi. And Assisi led the army in a coup d'etat to overthrow, to overthrow the Muslim Brotherhood. Who's Khashoggi, the one who was chopped up and killed? Mm -hmm. He was Muslim Brotherhood. Muslim Brotherhood is the Sunni equivalent of what, is hap what happened in Iran. Mm. So the question is this, if, and we spoke about this many years, yes. you know, about the oil and the steady oil prices and steady oil supplies, the, the royal family in Saudi Arabia is hated by 90% of the Saudis. They, they actually back Khashoggi. This is the beginning of a civil war, I believe, in Saudi Arabia, because the Muslim Brotherhood is waiting for the opportunity to annihilate the royal family. And today, you can get your oil from Saudi Arabia, or the world can get the oil. Tomorrow, it's not going to happen. Tomorrow, if the Muslim Brotherhood takes over, they're going to blow up the oil wells. Mm. Uh, you know, Iran doesn't want to sell oil to the countries that are with America, because Iran wants to destroy America. Now. Assisi, after one year of President Morsi, the Muslim Brotherhood president, uh, leads a coup d'etat, imprisons Morsi, who is guilty of many crimes, and the Muslim Brotherhood is put in jail. Muslim Brotherhood is made illegal in Egypt. Abdul Nasser did it in the uh, 50s and 60s. Um, you remember Sadat, who made peace with Israel. He yes. tried to cut a bargain with the Muslim Brotherhood. They killed him. You cannot do business with the Muslim Brotherhood. They are a threat to Egypt, and so the United States has to think about what is best for America's interests. Is it better to have the king of Saudi Arabia and the royal family, which I think inevitably are also doomed, or is it better to have the Muslim Brotherhood, who will do to Saudi Arabia what the, Muslim, the, the Shiites did in Iran and what they tried to do in Egypt with Morsi? Um, America's best interests will be served by keeping the royal family in power, and I would say, you know, uh, President uh, Trump is right in condemning this horrible behavior. But you have to understand something. This is normal behavior in the Muslim world. And, you know, uh, President George W. Bush, I have a lot of respect for George W. Bush, but he said something very wrong. He said that the war in Iraq in 2003 was about bringing overthrowing Saddam Hussein, bringing democracy to Iraq. You know what the Saudis said? Democracy in the Middle East over our dead bodies. Wow. In other words, there is no such thing as democracy in Islam. And so if you have al-Sisi, who is a, a dictator, if you have uh, all these leaders, the, the king of Saudi Arabia or his son, Mohammed bin Salman, is a dictator. I don't know if he gave the orders to, to kill Khashoggi, but the point is this is an internal matter of the Islamic world which America cannot get involved in. This is something, with all the pain, I say it, because I know a lot of very good uh, Republicans and Democrats are saying there should be an investigation and there should be punishment. What comes after the Saudi family? The Muslim Brotherhood. Muslim Brotherhood will be anti-American, anti-Christian, anti-Jewish, anti-Western. And if you're talking about stable oil prices and steady oil supplies, leave things alone. That's my message to President Trump. And very clearly stated, I might add, but you came right down to, to the point. Uh, who are our most dependable allies in that region? And obviously it would be uh, the, the, the people who've been in power now for how long? Uh, since since T.E. Lawrence. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So we really find ourselves now at a junction, a little, a little break point in history. Yes, I, I would say again, uh, there are a lot of plans 
uh, regarding Saudi Arabia, you know, I, we spoke about it before, a rail yeah. ra railroad that would go uh, through Jordan uh, with a link to Israel. Yes. So that uh, products could be shipped through Haifa uh, to Jordan and then down to Saudi Arabia and vice versa. Um, uh, the debate is, will the Japanese build a railway or will the Chinese build a railway? And there's so much uh, potential development uh, that could take place if we had good relations with all our neighbors. Uh, I don't know. I mean, I'm, I'm an optimist. I think sometimes we have a minister of transport, Israel Katz, who believes we can do it with the Saudis. I think that inherently there's a problem. And I think that eventually the, the, the kingdom of Saudi Arabia faces very serious existential problems with the Muslim Brotherhood. So the Khashoggi uh, event then uh, has presented us with a, a go, no go decision. We have to go with what's important for Western uh, survival. And that is, you know, at this point, we have to keep the Saudi royal family in power. Uh, before we leave today, I want to give uh, Avi an opportunity to talk about the Bible Bloc uh, party in Israel. Well, I'm proud to say that on May 13th, our party was officially recognized uh, by the Israeli government. Uh, we are now going to have our first party Congress, God willing, either in November, or early December. This has to be done as quickly as possible. Uh, I was here trying to raise monies uh, to pay for the hall and other things. We really don't run on, a, on any kind of a budget. But God is uh, remarkable with miracles. Uh, the party will have its conference. We will start campaigning. And if God wants us in the Knesset in, the next, in these next elections facing us, which could be any time in 2019, we will be in the, in the Knesset. If not, we continue working um, very pedantically until for the next elections in three, four years. A lot of Christians are saying, no, we're going to pray for you. You're going to be in the, in the next Knesset. I say, okay, I'm ready for that. If, God, if not, then I love you guys enough to come back every so often to Oklahoma City. Now, let's talk about the big fence, the fire kites, the rockets, the things that we've been hearing about in the news but between Israel and the Palestinians. Okay. Uh, we've spoken many times over the last 25 years about the differences in Judeo-Christian Western civilization and the Islamic uh, behavior, the Islamic culture. And here in the West and in Israel, uh, Jewish Israel really is an extension of Western Christianity. And we believe in fair play. We believe in uh, you bless me, I bless you. Uh, Genesis 12.3, I will bless those who bless you, curse those who curse you. And uh, basically, let's, let's be good. Let's be good with each other. This is the Western way, the Judeo-Christian way, mm -hmm. which I support. Um, I'm married to Rachel, who's also Jewish. I'm Jewish. I was born in America, but I think like a Christian, because I was born and raised, went through American schools, and the, the spirit of America is a Christian spirit, praise God. So yes. I think like a Christian. Amen. I moved to Israel 50 years ago. My wife is Jewish, but from Egypt. She was raised until age 20 in Egyptian schools, and her culture is Islamic. So I'm Jewish, I think like a Christian. She's Jewish, she thinks like a Muslim. She understands them. Uh -huh. And one of the things my wife taught me is that in the Middle East, you cannot be good. You have to be tough. Because in the Middle East, they respect tough, mean people. Hmm. Now, what we face today with the Palestinians is the nicer we are, the weaker we are, con we are considered. Now, Gaza has many problems. I think Gaza's first problem is Mahmoud Abbas, Abu Mazen, in Ramallah of the Palestinian Authority. We had three and a half years of good, quiet, alongside Gaza. And then uh, Abu Mazen decides in Ramallah to cut off all of the funding designated for Gaza. You remember Gaza is a strip along the sea uh -huh. and Abu Mazen is in the West Bank or Judea Samaria. Now when you say Abu Mazen, that's, that's his nom de guerre. That's, that's Mahmoud his, Abbas is his full name. It's yes. his full name, but, right. but when, when you say Abu Mazen, you're talking about a military leader, a revolutionary. Right, he, he, he is the heir of Yasser Arafat. And what he wants, and I would say, in his way of thinking, he's right. There should be one government. I mean, some people are talking about a Palestinian state, uh, but what we are lo looking at now, there are two Palestinian states. There's Gaza, 
and there's West Bank, Judea, Samaria. We shouldn't forget that Jordan is a third Palestinian state. 70% of Jordan is Palestinian. Mm -hmm. And we shouldn't forget that there's a fourth Palestinian state in the Triangle Towns north of Tel Aviv. So there are, I never heard of a country having, you know, a people having four nations uh, and then not r ready to recognize the Jewish state of Israel, which is the only country in the world which belongs to the Jews. Mm -hmm. uh, so anyway, so uh, Mahmoud Abbas, Abu Mazen, wants to uh, have the Hamas leadership, Hamas or Muslim Brotherhood, fanatic, uh, wants them to surrender their power to him. Now, he's a Muslim, but he's not considered a fanatic Muslim. He's more of a nationalist Muslim. And of course, for Hamas, he's not considered the leader that they like. Uh, so there's a struggle now, and, uh, and Mahmoud Abbas, Abu Mazen, controls the monies coming in from the taxes that the Palestinians pay to the Israeli government, which gets refunded back to the Palestinian leadership. And as a result, the Hamas people are freaking out. Mm. And uh, the uh, economy in Gaza is suffering. There's 50% unemployment. There's no money. Uh, the electricity is down to four or five hours a day uh, because they have to pay for the, uh, the, the gasoline, the oil, the solar, you know, to uh, kerosene to fuel their electrical stations. Uh, the sewage uh, system is collapsing, which means the sewage then flows into the sea and goes actually mm. to the Israeli southern beaches. Oh. Um, um, so the point I'm trying to say is, instead of Gaza coming to Israel saying, you know what, let's bypass Abu Mazen, Mahmoud Abbas, let's make a deal with Israel, let's be friends, and Israel will help us, we'll build an island in the Mediterranean, like you see in Dubai and all these other countries. We will push our borders to the west into the sea, have these deluxe luxury hotels, deluxe luxury neighborhoods, an airfield, a port, and Israel has said that they're willing to work with Gaza, just be nice. But like I said before, being nice is weakness. And so what do the Gazans do? They come up to the border fence and they sacrifice young boys and girls who get shot because they cut through the fence or blow up the fence with dynamite. And then they can blame the Israelis for shooting children. Then they blame the Israelis for shooting children. So what we see happening is that uh, in Gaza, there is a lot of uh, negotiation now. With the Egyptian government, the Egyptians under al-Sisi are trying their best to bring uh, Hamas to the table with Israel in order to find economic solutions for the people of Gaza. I mean, it's in the Egyptian interest also that there should be stability in Gaza. Don't forget, the Hamas leadership in Gaza has been supporting the Muslim Brotherhood against al-Sisi and against the Egyptian government, and they're killing Egyptian soldiers. So there's, they're trying to work out a deal here, which will be good for Israel, good for Hamas, and good for, for Egypt. And what we saw just a few days ago was two missiles fired at Beersheba and at Tel Aviv. One of the missiles hit, direct hit, destroyed a house, and the mother uh, frantically got her kids out of bed. They were sleeping already, it was in the middle of the night, and got them to the air raid shelter downstairs and locked the door like seconds before the missile hit. The, the house was destroyed. This was a mm. miracle from God that the mother and the three children survived. And the other missile was shot at Tel Aviv, but it landed in the sea, seashore, uh, just across from Tel Aviv. Of course, Tel Aviv is a very big city. Yes. So I was up all night because I was on, on the phone with my uh, son in Israel, Daron, and we were talking about will there be a war because Israel has said something like this could ignite a war. But, but Hamas very, very strangely said, this is not our missile. This is a missile from some renegade group which wants to destroy any kind of chance of, I don't want to say peace, but anything that could be good for the pe their own people because it would show weakness. In other words, if you tell the truth, it's weakness. If you are nice, it's weakness. Mm -hmm. If you think about the good of your own people, it's weakness. Wow. And what these people want is to destroy Israel, destroy the Jews on Saturday, destroy the Christians on Sunday. It's the devil, it's Satan. Now, all of this began uh, with uh, years ago, and you can name the date, when Israel vacated Gaza in the name of peace. Right. And no peace came. Right. Where are we going? Okay, this is a very good question. Um, the, I'm going to say something now which many of your uh, viewers uh, probably don't know. And, you know, I myself was against the withdrawal from Gaza in the first place. Mm -hmm. Ariel Sharon uh, had a real reason for pulling out of Gaza 
And uh, I think many Israelis silently agree this was correct. It was painful that we had to pull our people out. Yes. Um, I don't know if you remember, but while Israel was in Gaza and we had our settlements and everybody said, oh, we're okay, we're fine, we're fine, we're fine. Uh, Hamas was digging tunnels underneath the Israeli settlements and underneath Israeli army positions. And we had one very strategic position which got blown to kingdom come by a tunnel which was underneath. They have these engineers who do these tunnels very accurately. Uh, they put a half a ton of dynamite, Hamas, and they blew up this observation post and five Israeli soldiers. By the way, they were Bedouin Arabs. They were, they were Arab Muslims hmm. in the Israeli army. They were killed by this explosion. And we knew that they were digging tunnels under our settlements in Gaza. And so Sharon said, listen, if we cannot root out the problem, which means basically a massive war against mm -hmm. Hamas, we need to pull out of Gaza because we are indefensible. That was the real reason we pulled out of Gaza. And so I respect Ariel Sharon, even though everyone says, well, he died because he got a brain tumor, no, a brain hemorrhage, because he went against God and gave back the land. And okay, but from a mili strictly military perspective, Ariel Sharon was right. If you cannot defend the position, you pull out. Now, what we see happening in Gaza is that okay, we pulled out. We pulled out for peace. The the, the Palestinians say no. You pulled out because you were losing. Weakness leads to more weakness. It's like if you're at the beach and you see a shark coming and you start throwing stakes at the shark. The shark gobbles up the stakes. You think he's going to say, well, you have a nice day. No, the shark is going to have his <laughs> appetite whetted to come and get you. And so the Palestinians said, well, yeah, they pulled out of Gaza. It wasn't for peace. It was because their situation was untenable. And we're going to make their situation untenable now across the border in Israel. And that's why they built all those tunnels. And we are discovering the tunnels day by day. You're listening to uh, Avi Lipkin, our good friend. We carry seven of Avi's books, all seven of the books that he's written. And uh, we offer them as a package for $79.95. You can check them out at prophecywatchers.com, the online bookstore. Uh, the last two, Islam prophesied in Genesis, <clears throat> Islamic rivalry. It says ISIS and Iran are fighting for the heart of Islamic identity. He writes in a very expert way. <clears throat> if you're confused by what's happening in the Middle East, you would do well to look at these books. Um, where are we going? Okay, that's a very good question. We have a saying in Hebrew, translated is, you know, sometimes when you have to accept an agreement that you don't like, you say, yeah. we've got to swallow the frogs. And, um, and so my son said to me this morning, we have to swallow the frogs. We cannot bomb the heck out of them because they sent two missiles. Um, even if it was Hamas that did it, uh, you have to remember, this is a domino, okay? If we attack Gaza, if we cream them, if we really, really attack them with all our might, then we, the, there's a great possibility that Hezbollah will come from Lebanon and fire its 100,000 missiles at Israel. Mm -hmm. yeah. And many of them have very strong accuracy. So if we attack Hezbollah in Lebanon, then Syria and Iran will attack Israel. Mm -hmm. If we attack Syria and Iran, then Russia attacks Israel. So this could lead to World War III and you know, I think that President Trump and Benjamin Netanyahu are in total agreement. We do not want World War III. So you're talking about a very complex and delicate balance of powers. Right. Everything has to be played against everything else. Right. From Russia all the way down into the Middle East. Right. And in fact, I would say one more thing. In spite of the criticisms against Netanyahu, that he's all talk and no action, uh, I would say that the vast majority of Israelis uh, know someone or lost someone in the family to wars over the last 70 years. Mm. And the vast majority of Israelis do not want a war under any circumstances with Gaza. Because in the end, we still have to deal with the future of Gaza. And the future of Gaza is, you know, maybe get rid of the Hamas leadership, but it's gonna cost a lot of Israeli soldiers' lives and civilian lives from the missiles, the missile barrage. And in the end, we still have to make peace with these people. Um, either make peace or wipe them out. And of course, the world won't let us wipe them out. And the Jewish conscience won't let us wipe them out. So all we want is that they behave nice. But remember what I said at the beginning of the show, mm. behaving nice is weakness. There is a cultural problem here. Yes. And so we want to be nice. We've offered them our help. 
One last question. <clears throat> As I'm looking at the Middle East, I'm also seeing other countries. Uh, Europe and Turkey are coming together in an alliance, so particularly Germany and Turkey. Uh, and then you have the Stans, Kazakhstan, and, and up to the north. And then as you move over uh, through Persia, Iran, eastward, uh, you find that there are a number of groups preparing sort of to head west into, and involve themselves in the Middle East. Uh, where's this all going? And I, and I know this is a tough question to answer in a brief uh, uh, few minutes, but uh, give it your best. One of the reasons Turkey is not accepted into the European Union is because you have 300 million, I don't want to say Christians, but you have 300 million non-Muslims in Europe. You have 50 million Muslims. Mm. Now, if Turkey joins the European Union, then you'll have 50 million plus 70 million Anatolian Turks, meaning Turkey, so 120 million. But then you have the stands. The stands are Turks, and they are all entitled to Turkish passports, which means 200 million former Soviet Turks, 200 million plus 70 plus 50 is 320 million, and they all become members of the European Union. And so the European Union overnight becomes a Muslim continent. Is that what the Europeans want? The answer is no. No. And I believe you're going to see a Trump-type reaction. Uh, and many European leaders, which you already see rising up, are against the inclusion of Turkey in the European Union. So the question then is going to be, what's going to be the relationship, uh, a love-hate relationship with the Turks? A lot of people are thinking about Ezekiel 38 as you're talking. You know, and. Uh, because there is going to be a major war. The Bible predicts it. Uh, a lot of people have tried to sort out all the parts and pieces and set dates and so forth. You can't do that at all. But uh, we do know that something very, very dynamic and dramatic is going to happen in the Middle East. And your fellow Israelis, are they conscious of, of this sort of an impending situation? It, exactly, and that's why I'm saying all along that the vast majority of Israelis do not want any kind of a military adventure under any circumstances, because in the end, the bottom line remains the same. So what we, what we want is a peaceful situation. We want our boys and girls not to be killed in battle. We want our civilians not to be killed in missile strikes. Uh, we just want to continue the great prosperity we have in Israel. Uh, we are going up every year by a million tourists. It's unbelievable. My son is overwhelmed. There's so much tourism coming to Israel now. Wow. Pray for Israel. You've got an idea of what Israel is up against. Of course, God decides. Amen. And I believe God favors Israel. Amen. Yes. Avi Lipkin, our good friend, uh, pray uh, that the Lord prepare his footsteps as he travels from one place to another. He's constantly traveling all over the world. And uh, he always comes with something interesting for us. I'm Gary Stearman. Thanks for joining us. Uh, Hey, we're watching. You be watching too. Thanks for joining us on Prophecy Watchers. You can find us on the web at prophecywatchers.com where you can sign up for our free email newsletter. In the meantime, keep watching everybody and we'll see you soon.